<laughs> well, um, we've been studying the tabernacle, and uh, this is about the fifth week, I think, or the fifth evening of studying the tabernacle. And we've come kind of a long way. Last week, we did kind of a, um, um, a panel up here, and Pastor Tom shared about righteousness, and Pastor Nathan shared about the atonement through the, the uh, uh, altar and, and the brazen altar, and Pastor Sheena shared a little bit about the cleansing that takes place at the laver. And tonight, uh, we want to move just a little bit further, just a little bit further into this teaching of the tabernacle. I hope you're enjoying it. I'm, I'm enjoying studying it. I'm enjoying preparing for it. But you know, I, I, I'm never able to totally communicate everything that, that God is putting in my heart about this. Uh, I think one of the most difficult things in life is the, is the ability to communicate what God's put in your heart. But I'm, I'm, I'm learning so much about my relationship with the Lord and uh, how that relationship is to be so intense with the Lord. And again, I don't know that I can communicate everything that God's put in my heart uh, for this evening or any evening, but um, with, with every ounce of my strength, I will try to communicate with you uh, what I believe the tabernacle is saying to us. Um, I want to read you just a little um, comment before I, I get into some, some definite teaching this evening. The true nature, I want you to hear this, the true nature of worship is seeking God's face. Uh, the Christian walk is a life that is devoted to seeking the presence of God and his favor in our lives. The Lord wants us to humbly and trustfully seek his face. And so many times the scripture says that in prayer and in time was the word. And that requires, and here's the word, intimacy. That requires intimacy uh, to look intently into someone's face. Pursuing God's face is comparable to developing an intimate relationship with him. Psalms chapter 63, you don't have to turn there, I'll just read it to you. I don't have it up on the overhead, but I want you to listen intently. Oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. I've seen you in your sanctuary and I've gazed upon your power and glory. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. Let me say that one more time to you. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you. Now this evening, I want to talk to you about intimacy. I want to talk to you about a close relationship with our Savior. Um, thus far, we have discussed the outer court. I don't know whether um, I don't know whether you have those pictures from last week or week before last or or several weeks ago. But um, the, the tabernacle proper. Oh, you ask, and there it is. Uh, the tabernacle proper. We've talked about. The, the curtain, we've talked about the gate. The gate is Jesus Christ. We've talked about the brazen altar uh, as, as our, uh, that, that symbolic atonement for our sins, that Jesus Christ met all that criteria and, and died once and for all, that we might be redeemed, redemption from our sins. And we've talked about the, the uh, uh, labor uh, which is the cleansing power of the Holy Spirit as we read the word. And all of those things, righteousness and redemption and cleansing through the word of God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, is what God does for us. Uh, you can't do that for yourself. I can't do that for myself. Many of you have many, probably tried to, to be better. You know, I want to be better. Uh, um, I remember growing up as a kid, I, when I'd get in trouble, I'd always tell mom, I want to be better. I want to be better. And my dad would threaten me, if you're not better, you're going to die. But, uh, um, but it was, it, I wanted to be better. I wanted to be better. But, I, but it is impossible to be better in life without the 
power of the Holy Spirit through Christ Jesus. The only way that a person can rid themselves of, of, of sin and, and, and all the things that sin brings into our life is through the power of Christ. Not anything else. Not anything else. Uh, so, so we have righteousness imparted to us. We have redemption. We have the cleansing of, of, of the water through the word of God. And the outer court speaks of, of, of salvation and being saved. It speaks of, of the change that occurs. You know, if any man be in Christ, he is what? A new creature through Christ. It speaks of the change that occurs in us, the, the cleansing, the, the total work of transformation for us, that we might be prepared, please hear this, for his presence. That we might be prepared for his presence. Now, we talked about all of that. Now we're going to enter the, the, the very first room in the tabernacle called the holy place. There was a curtain and only the priest only the priest. This, the outer court was for everyone, but the inner court was for just the priest. And the priest would go in behind the veil. You say, well, that's not for me. That must be for the clergy. That's not. Here's what the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Listen to it. And you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priest. What does that mean to us? That as a believer, we are given the responsibility of being a priest in the household of God. We are priests, uh, I'll finish the verse, through the mediation of Jesus Christ who offers uh, you who offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. First Peter chapter two, verse nine. But you are not like that. You're a chosen generation. Who's that speaking to? Speaking to you and speaking to me. You're a chosen generation. You're a royal, a royal priesthood, a kingly priesthood. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. God's very own possession and as a result, you can show others the goodness of God for he called you out of darkness into marvelous light. And, and here's what I want to say about that. You were saved by the power of the Holy Spirit to be forgiven, to be saved, not just as an escape from hell, for, but more than that. You were saved by the power of the Holy Spirit for more than, just, um, more than just singing a few songs on Sunday morning and listening to a great sermon. You were saved for more than that. You were, you were brought into the kingdom for more than just, I'm on my way to heaven. More than that. And this evening... That's what I want to talk about. The more you desire to be closer to the Lord, listen to James chapter four, verse seven. Draw near to God and he will draw nigh to you or near to you. The, the, the closer you get to Christ, the more you understand your true purpose and destiny as a believer. Now, I said last week uh, when we closed that a lot of the church, a lot of the church is satisfied. They're satisfied just to know that I'm saved and I'm on my way to heaven. Um, that's all I need. It's, it's like a ticket to glory. And what I'm discovering and what I, what I know of the Holy Spirit is this is that there's more. You know, I, um, I used to, when I attended church years and years and years and years before I was in the ministry, um, I didn't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I, uh, I was saved. I loved the Lord. I went to church every Sunday. 
I sang victory in Jesus. I listened to sermons on the prodigal son. I got saved a number of times over and over again because I'd, I'd done things that I shouldn't do and I felt like I needed to get saved again. I didn't have a whole lot of wisdom, but, but um, and I did that many, many years of my life. But in doing that, deep down inside my heart of hearts, I'm, and I'm being as, just as transparent as I can with you this evening, deep down inside, I felt like there's got to be more. There's got to be more than just attending church and being saved and going to heaven. There's, there's got to be more. And then when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I said, wow, that's, that, was, that was the more. That was great. It was wonderful. I mean, the Lord filled me with his Holy Spirit and the joy of that and the, and, and the wonder of that was just awesome. And the, and the availability to commune with God in, a, in, that, in that prayer language was phenomenal. It was great. But even after I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, deep down, I'm just being transparent. I felt like there's got to be more. There's got to be more. And the more that I so desire in my life is that intimacy with Christ. That intimacy through the power of the Holy Spirit to be one with him. One with him. I think the uh, Passion Bible says it this way in that James chapter four, move your heart closer to God and he will come closer to you. Move your heart closer to God and he will come closer to you. Now, on the outside, on the outer court, there's a lot of commotion. There's animals being sacrificed. There's people talking. There's people yelling. There's, there's, all kinds of act, there's all kinds of activity going on outside. But when you enter that holy place, all of a sudden, it's quiet. Now, the difference between the outer court and the holy place, there's many significant differences. But, but the basic significant is, difference is this, is in the outer court, all you see is bronze, and sacrifice, and water, and blood. And all you see in the inner court is gold. And in that inner court, the aroma in the air is of freshly baked bread, oil that has been part of the lampstand, and incense burning on that small little altar. And when you step into that holy place, everything out here diminishes. Do you understand what I'm talking about? It subsides. It dulls. In comparison, when you walk behind the curtain and your eyes begin to see the gold, the gold of the table of showbread, the gold of the lampstand beaten of one piece of gold, the, the gold of the of the altar of incense and the walls, the walls made of gold. And there's something about being in that atmosphere that brings a holy hush to your spirit. Let me give you another example. Uh, the outer court is like a family picnic. <laughs> the holy of holies is like a romantic dinner. Some of you guys need to rethink that. Romantic dinners. Have you forgotten about romantic dinners? Um, the outer court is, is for the public. It's for, it's for all the people. The inner court is for ministry to God. It's, it's designed. It is designed for closeness. It's designed for warmth. There's no f formality here. There's no formality it, it, it is, it is, this is the place, this is the place where Moses would enter into and talk face to face with God. This is the place where Moses would, would question God and God would tell him things face to face. Well, let's read about it just for a moment. Exodus chapter 25, verses 23 through 30. 
Then make a table of acacia wood, the Bible says. 36 inches long, 18 inches wide, 27 inches high. Overlay it with pure gold and run a gold molding around the edge. Decorate it with three inch borders all around and, and run a gold molding along the border. Make four gold rings. Notice the, the gold. Make four gold rings for the table and attach them to the four corners next to the four legs. And attach the rings near the border to hold the poles that are used to carry, to, to carry the table. Make these poles of acacia wood. Overlay them with pure gold. Make special containers of pure gold for the table, bowls and ladles and pitchers and jars to be used in pouring out liquid offerings. Place the bread of the presence on the table to remain before me at all times. In this holy place, there were three articles of furniture. There was the table of showbread, which we're going to talk about tonight, which I just described to you. There was the candle stand or the candlestick that... Uh, that illuminated the holy place. It was oil and uh, had to be trimmed every morning. And then back near the, near the curtain that, that enclosed the Holy of Holies was the altar of incense. There was, there was only three articles of furniture in this holy place. Uh, the table of showbread representing the, the communion that we have with Christ, the communion, the oneness that we have with Christ and the, the um, lampstand symbolizing the, the illumination into the deep things of the Spirit of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. And then, of course, the altar of incense that continually burned and the aroma of, aroma of that filled the room, uh, which, which is symbolic of our worship experience, our worship experience. But tonight, let's, let's focus on the uh, table of showbread for a moment. Uh, the table of showbread was not a large piece of furniture. It was only about two feet high. It was about three feet long and a foot and a half wide. It wasn't very big. But on the table of showbread, there were 12 loaves of unleavened bread um, baked and placed there every Sabbath day. Now, the priest could partake of the bread, and then, the, and then it had to be replaced um, it was something like, um, have you ever seen uh, matzah? Have you ever seen, you know what matzah is? Have you ever seen matzah? Something like that. Only it was baked in round circles. And there were 12 of them representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, it was called, um, well, let, let, me, let, me, let me tell you how it was made. It was made with flour and water. And the flour and the water were mixed hurriedly together and it was baked very rapidly so that it did not have a chance to rise. Um, it was placed upon the, the table. And there was also um, uh, uh, on the table uh, vessels that contained wine for the drink offering. So imagine on the table there were uh, uh, containers that contained wine and 12 uh, loaves of bread. Um, Exodus chapter 25 is a very important verse. I want you to see this. Exodus 25 verses 30, verse 30 says that the Place, this is how we are to do this, place the bread of the presence on the table to remain before me at all times. Place the bread of the presence on the table to remain before me at all times. Now, um, a, little, a, little, a little Hebrew lesson. Bread in Hebrew is lachem, lachem. I said I practiced that all day long so I could say that correctly. Lachem. Because with Hebrew, you've got to go to lachem. So bread is lachem. And the presence, or um, before me, as it were, is the Hebrew word ponim. P A W N E M. Ponim. It literally means this it is the bread. That faces it is the bread that faces. So, what we what we see here in the in the holy of holies as we as we discuss this first piece of furniture is that 
there was a table and the instruction to Moses was this, put place bread on the table, change it once a week on the Sabbath. And it was the bread of the faces. Um, There's something significant about sitting down having fellowship together. Would you agree with that? that there, there's, there's something very special about fellowship. I, I, love, um, I love it when, when Pastor Kurt and I go out to lunch. We, we have great fellowship together. We just talk and have a great time. There's something about fellowship. There's something about breaking bread together that, that brings us into a different arena, as it were. Um, and the bread of the presence speaks of fellowship with God. Um, and, and that's something that's, that's not only highlighted in Exodus, but it goes all the way back to, to uh, uh, Genesis. Now, let me read your verse in Genesis chapter 14, verses 18 through 20. Um, this is talking about um, Melchizedek. Melchizedek is probably a um, a symbol or a type of Christ. And in Genesis chapter 14, the scripture says this, and Melchizedek, the king of Salem, a priest of the most high God, brought Abram some bread and wine. Interesting. And Melchizedek blessed Abram with this blessing, blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high who has defeated your enemies for you. Then Abram gave Melchizedek a tenth of all the goods he had, he had recovered. And this fellowship, this, this communion, this, this bread and wine uh, is something that is, that is so relevant throughout the scriptures uh, because again, it speaks of communion. The, the word communion is taken from the word commune. And commune, it literally means to communicate, as it were. Did you follow me there? It means to communicate. So uh, to communicate means to say or to speak or to talk or to act, having, having something in common, right? So eating and drinking and fellowshipping is just part of the Christian dynamics. And it brings us into a closer relationship. Um, we, uh, we just went out to dinner with, with uh, Jim and Sherry the, the other day and just, and just uh, really, it's just so enjoyed just being with them and breaking bread together with them. And, and um, it, was, it was enjoyable. It was encouraging. It was... Um, uh, stimulating. It was, it was wonderful just to break bread. Now, in our society, let, let me just tell you this. In our society, we have, um, we have um, not highlighted that very much. Uh, we live in a very, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll pull this out. We live in a very um, cell phone-oriented culture. Um, I don't have to look at you. I can just text you. Um, you know what I mean? Um, how many of you ever sent a text and the wrong word has showed up? Be honest. Come on now. Be on. Okay. Yep. That's what I thought. Yeah. Um, would that have happened had you been face to face with that individual? Probably not. When our, um, when our youngest, or, or not our youngest, our, our son was uh, very young, very young. Um, he was still in arms holding him. And, and when, he, um, when he wanted our attention, I probably said this to you before, but when he wanted our attention, he would take, he would take my face and turn it towards his. And, and he would say, Daddy. And then he would turn my face towards him so that I would look at him face to face. Face to face. Can I tell you, that is the, that's the image of the table of showbread, face to face with Jesus. That's intimacy. But again, in our culture, we, um, we, we kind of stand at arm's length uh, with each other. Um, I, I thought, I don't know exactly how to demonstrate this for you this evening. I, I, I was, I was going to call uh, 
someone up and, and try to get close to them. But then I thought, what if, what if they don't have a problem with intimacy? And, and then I get so close and I, the illustration wouldn't work. So I thought, I'm not going to do that. But, but let, me, let, me just, let me just say this to you. How many of you are married? Married with spouses? Okay. Um, um, can you get really close to your wife or your husband? Yeah. Um, Has your, has, your, has your spouse ever, wives are notorious for this, has your wife ever said, just hold me? Just hold me. I just want to be held. Uh, yeah, um, that's intimacy. Now, I wouldn't do that with Josh Rudder. <laughs> Would you? No. I mean, I love Josh with all of my heart. I really do. I love spending time with Josh, but I wouldn't get that close to Josh. Um, not because I don't love him. It's just that I'm not that intimate with Josh. And he's okay with that. See there? He's okay with that. In this culture that we live in, um, Society says, distance yourself. Let, 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 can, can I give you an example? Let me give you an example. Years ago, long before many of you were alive, we used to build houses. And we built houses like this. We built houses and we put really huge front porches on the houses. And the reason we did that is because you sat on your porch. You probably don't remember this. Unfortunately, I do. <laughs> You sat on your front porch, as, the, as, as everyone walked down the street, you went, hey, Mary, hey, Sam, hi, Nick, hey, what, I saw your kids out the other day, they weren't behaving themselves, yeah, we, we, we built huge front porches, today, we build small front porches and huge back porches, why do we do that? Because we don't want to be intimate. We don't want to be intimate. We want to keep everyone at arm's length, as it were. And, and unfortunately, unfortunately, and here's my point, unfortunately, many believers do that with our Savior. To keep him at arm's length. Don't get too close. Why? Why don't we want him to get close? We are afraid of his revelation we're afraid that he'll know too much. I, um, uh, every once in a while, I kiss my wife. Every once in a while, I know it's hard to believe. Every once in a while, I kiss my wife. And I, um, uh, a couple weeks ago, about, about a month ago, she fell and she hit, her, she hit her face right there. She hit her face and she had to have stitches uh, right there. I'm, I'm probably telling this, and she's, she's probably at home going, well, you know, now everybody knows. Uh, but anyway, she has stitches right there. But uh, from a distance, you can't see them. You can't, you can't tell there's anything. But, but when you get close, I can see the, the, little, the little indentation. And, and I guess we're, we're afraid that if we get so close to the Lord, he'll know everything about us. Can, can, I, can I just tell you this? He knows everything about you already. Everything. And, comma, and he loves you. And he wants you to become close to him. Someone wrote this, and I, I, just, I just happened to include it in my notes. Imagine this, that we get to meet with the creator of the universe when we gather together as people of God the one who spoke the worlds and formed them, the one who breathed and life was born. He's always with us. But when we gather together as his people, he meets us in a very special way. God tells us that where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am among them. That's in Matthew chapter 18, verse 20. But Ray Orlin uh, talks about that verse when he says this, if you show up, so will I, is not what he's saying. 
Here's what, here's, what, here's what that verse really means. If you gather to be with me, I'm already there waiting for you, ready and eager to be with you. <laughs> God desires intimacy with us. And tonight, I, I, I want to focus, I, I brought, um, I brought uh, communion with me. I didn't bring it for everybody, I just brought it for me. Um, but I brought communion because that's what the table of showbread signifies. It signifies uh, the bread and, and the cup, and it signifies that intimacy of communion. Uh, let, let me take you to a verse in Luke chapter um, uh, 24, and I, and I, I, I want to um, make sure that I, I hurry along to get all of the, what I want to share with you tonight in. Luke chapter 24, verses 27 through 30. If you remember the story, Jesus um, has been crucified. He has risen from the dead. Two of his disciples have left Jerusalem and are walking to Emmaus, and which was not a very long journey, uh, just um, a, a day's walk probably. But as they're walking along, talking about everything that's taken place in Jerusalem and the devastation of that and what happened and what they were thinking about uh, all of that time, Jesus appears and begins to walk with them. Let me pick up with verse 27. Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets and explaining to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. That must have been an awesome Walk. That must have been an awesome conversation when Jesus said, this was talking about me and that was talking about me. That must have been an awesome conversation. By the time they were nearing Emmaus and the end of their journey, Jesus acted as if, he, if, as if he was going on. But they begged him, stay the night with us since it is getting late. So he went home with them. As they sat down to eat, he took bread and blessed it, and then he broke it and gave it to them. And suddenly, suddenly their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. And they said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? But here's what I want you to see in, in, in that story. As Jesus begins to explain the scriptures to them, they felt something something in their heart, something stirring within them, but they didn't recognize him. They didn't know it was Jesus. They, they, they didn't realize that the resurrected Savior, the Son of God, was walking with them as he explained the scriptures to them. And, and there's, there's a powerful um, um, uh, uh, situation about, about explaining scriptures. That, that's powerful. But they didn't, they didn't know it was him until... He sat down and began to break the bread and blessed it until he began communion with them. And then the Bible says their eyes were, their eyes were opened and they understood it was Jesus. They saw it was Jesus and he instantly disappeared. And then they remembered, man, that was so glorious. That was so wonderful. Here's an observation I, I, I want to make with you concerning that scripture. And, and this is my observation. I believe that sometimes we have um, missed the opportunity for intimacy with the Lord's Supper. Um, the early church practiced communion probably on a daily basis. Um, Acts chapter 2, I don't know whether we have this up there or not, but Acts chapter 2, verse 42 and 46, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. Verse 46 says they, they worshiped together in the temple each day, met in homes for the, for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with joy and generosity. Acts chapter 20, verse 7 on the first day of the week, they gathered with local believers to share in the Lord's Supper. Paul was preaching to them, and since he was leaving the next day, he kept preaching until midnight. Well, thank God that doesn't happen anymore, but uh, preaching till midnight. But uh, the first day of the week, they gathered together and had communion. It was, uh, it was the practice of the early church 
to meet together in fellowship and have communion. It was the, to be honest with you, as, as I read church history a little bit, and I'm not an authority on church history, but, but as I read church history, it was, the, it was the center of their meeting together. Every time they met together, they fellowshiped, they encouraged, they strengthened, and they shared in communion. Yes, there was teaching, but they shared in communion. Um, for nearly 1,500 years, for nearly 1,500 years, uh, the church's focal point was communion. It was the center of everything the church did. Um, yes, there were, there were at times people that, that objected to that. There were certain uh, uh, church fathers that, that said, I, I don't know that communion is, is that important. Um, but, but in essence, 90, 95% of the church adopted this philosophy that communion is at the focal point of everything we do. And, and by that, here's what I mean. Intimacy, fellowship with Christ, oneness with Christ is at the center. It wasn't until 1525 um, or thereabouts that a man by the name of Yorick, um, um, Yorich rather, um, I, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, uh, Urich, let me make sure, Swigley, S-W-I-N-G-L-Y, Urich, Swigley, and John Calvin, who are some of the uh, fathers of our, of our Reformation, decided that, uh, or made this objection, that, that communion is nothing more than just a symbol. Um, they, they said this, that communion is like a wedding ring. It's just a symbol of your marriage. And it, it, it is, it's a symbol of marriage. Um, and, and the, and, but for 1,500 years, for some reason, God didn't have any problem with communion being the, the focal point of the church. Um, Uric um, Swigley said that we need to replace the communion table with the pulpit. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. We need to be taught the word of God. But what he did was, when he said that communion lost some of its significance. The Catholic Church believes in, in a doctrine called transubstantiation. That, that doctrine teaches that for some of you who are Catholic, you know what I'm talking about. That at the consecration of the bread, the bread actually becomes the body of Christ and the cup or the wine becomes the blood of Christ. Um, and uh, please don't misunderstand me. I am not uh, by any means suggesting that uh, that is reality. I'm not suggesting that at all. Please don't misunderstand me. But here's what I am suggesting, that we have in the church minimized the power of intimacy through communion. Let me say that again. Because I want you to hear that. We have minimized the power and the intimacy of communion. We, and I've said it myself, it's just a symbol, just a symbol. But I'm, I'm honestly rethinking that. And again, I, I am not, I'm, I'm not going to become Catholic. I'm, thank God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'm not going to believe in transubstantiation that it turns into the actual body and blood of Christ. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. But I, but I am seeing as, as an intimate sacrament, as an intimate relationship with Christ, I need to highlight this event in my life. Um, let me give you uh, just a couple of scriptures here. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 16 through 17 when we bless the cup at the Lord's table, aren't we sharing in the blood of Christ? When we break the bread, aren't we sharing in the body of Christ? And though we are many, 
We all eat from one loaf of bread showing that we are one body. That word, that word sharing, that word, I think the King James Version uses participating, is the word koinonia. And koinonia is, is, a, is, is, the, is the Greek word for uh, fellowship or an intimate relationship. So, so we might read it this way. When we bless the cup at the Lord's table, are we not bring, coming into intimate relationship with Christ? When we break the bread, are we not coming into intimate relationship with Christ? Now, to take that one step further, there's a, there's a, there's a verse of scripture in the Psalms, and, and you're familiar with it. it. It says, God, listen to this, inhabits the praises of his people. Does the scripture say that? Am I, am I right in that? Am I? God inhabits the praises. So in order, in, and we believe that. In, in other words, when we're praising God, we believe that the presence of God in habits comes to dwell as we praise God. That's, isn't that what that verse means? I have, I have taught before that, that when the word, the inspiration of the word, the, the word being inspired, according to first, uh, Second Timothy, that, that, the, the insp- that word inspiration literally means God breathed. That, that, that this word is actually breathed, this the breath of God. It is, and we believe that. We believe in the inspiration of the word of God. Why can we not believe then that communion is becoming one with Christ. Intimacy. Um, another scripture. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty nine 29 through 30. For if we eat the bread and drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking judgment upon yourself. That's why many of you are weak and sick and some have even died. And I read that scripture and I say, Paul, Paul, why are you so, why are you so hard on that? Why are you so dogmatic about that? Why are you, why such warning, Paul? Why, why? Because I believe Paul understood the intimacy that is available to us through the bread and through the cup. And the warning there is so stern uh, that the, the, the body of Christ is also used in Matthew 27 when it says that, jo- that Joseph begged for the body of Jesus, also in Mark chapter 14. It's, it's not only talking about the body of Christ, it's talking about Christ's body. We just don't take communion. We enter into communion. So, I need to begin to close. The holy place was a place of intimacy with God. It was a place of communion. It was a place of worship. It was a place of illumination into the deep things of the Spirit of God. It was a place where God spoke with his people face to face. Face to face. I I guess my encouragement to you this evening is this. Um, When we look at the bread um, that Jesus took with his disciples in that upper room as he celebrated Passover and he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. What he was really talking about is the intimacy that you can have with Christ. And when the disciples took that bread and ate it, they were partaking of the oneness of the Spirit with Christ Jesus. 
And then when he took the cup, it was really the cup of Elijah. And he said, this cup is my blood shed for you. He was really talking about the oneness that we can have with Christ as we partake of him and all that he is. How can that be accomplished? I, I, I'll close with this tonight. How can it be accomplished? It can only be accomplished when we shut out the noise of this world. And, the, and the, all of the stuff that we deal with daily. And we come into a quiet, restful place of just you and Jesus. And you can look at him face to face and in intimacy you can say I love you Lord and I lift my voice to worship you oh my soul rejoice take joy my king as you something something I forget the words I love you, Lord. And I want to encourage you tonight. I want to encourage you tonight. As I am learning, I'm learning this. I'm, I sure haven't arrived. I sure haven't. And, I, and again, I wish I could communicate everything that's in my heart. I encourage you tonight to take the time that is necessary. Uh, listen, if I'm just five minutes with my wife and say, honey, I love you, God bless you, let me give you a hug, I've got things to do. That's not intimacy. But if I take my time and I hold her and she likes for her back to be rubbed right there, right there, she likes for her back to be rubbed right there. And I kiss her and I tell her how much I love her. I tell her how much I can't live without her. And I tell her that she's the sweetest thing in all my life. I tell her that uh, I just couldn't live without her. That's intimacy. And may I suggest to you, that's what Jesus wants with you. That's what he wants with you. So that your relationship with him is more than life. More than life. And that is the more. The more that I'm talking about. There's got to be more. Um, I, I, I'll close. Um, I don't know if anything else I need to say. Is there anything else I need to say? Okay, all right. <laughs> I, I hope you, I, I, did you hear my heart tonight? I hope you heard my heart tonight. I, I, um, um, I hope you heard my heart tonight. Let me, let, let me, let me close with a scripture. And this is scripture. There, there's no other way to partake in the body of, of the broken body of the Lord except through deep humility and a sense of intimacy that will, that's taking us deeply into him and him into us. Scripture says in John chapter six, verse 55, for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. And he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides, abides, abides in me and I in him. And Christ is literally giving himself to us. We are literally giving ourselves to him as we are partaking of all that he is. In Jesus' name. Thank you again for joining us. We pray that you are blessed and encouraged by our service. And we invite you to join us again next week. Our services go live every Sunday at 9 a.m. on Facebook, YouTube, and at wordoflife.church. And we also meet in person every Sunday at 9 and 11 a.m. If God is using our church to change your life and you'd like to help us lead people to life in Jesus through giving, you can do so by visiting wordoflife.church give, or you can text your donation amount to 84321. Follow along with us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube if you'd like to know more about what God is doing in and through our church. God is doing incredible things here, and we are so honored that you chose to spend your time with us.